Welcome to this video message today. Because of the icy conditions outside and some things going wrong with the building here at uh, First Baptist Church, we're going to gather together around this time of virtual uh, Bible study. I've been thinking about some things that I think are, are rather important in the life of the church. For one, transformation, I believe, is an important and urgent need in contemporary Christian life. The New Testament word for transformation is metamorphosis, and it actually appears in the text that I want us to read in just a moment. I need to tell you a little bit more about metamorphosis in order to uh, make the point that I think the scripture would convey to us today. Um, nothing became something when God created the heavens and the earth. And the climactic moment of creation came when God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. But sometime later, the serpent slithered into the garden where the man and the woman lived and, and worked and tempted the man and the woman to disobey God. And when the man and the woman disobeyed God, the entire creation transformed, went through the struggle of metamorphosis in a cataclysmic metamorphosis that we call the fall. Now, this is foundational for understanding the gospel and for understanding everything there is to know about the Christian life. When this fall occurred, the law of sin and death, like gravity, the law of gravity, took over and affected all of life, the whole creation, the whole universe. Sin, death, decay, hardship, disappointment, discouragement, broken relationships, and all kinds of negative things like that result from disobeying God. And the problem that you and I face is that we all are participants in that same kind of disobedience that the man and the woman in the garden did. But God set in motion a plan he conceived before the foundation of the world, before he ever made creation, in order to save the creation. At just the right time, according to the plan, God loved the world. God gave his one and only son, Jesus so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. Now, here's how it happens. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus existed in the form of God. He himself underwent a kind of metamorphosis. He emptied himself. He took the form of a servant, though he existed in the form of God. He was found in the likeness of a man. He humbled himself further by becoming obedient, even to a death experience, a cross kind of death, is how Paul writes it. And so, because he was willing to die for the sins of all the people of all the ages, God has exalted him. He is our only Savior. He is our only salvation. Now, God gave three disciples a glimpse of Jesus' original glory. We find this in the account that is in Mark 9, verses 2 through 9. Mark 9 is where I'd like you to open your Bible to today. We'll just kind of camp out there for a little bit and uh, see what we can see about this metamorphosis, this transformation that needs to occur in the life of the contemporary church. The writer says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Well, Matthew reports the voice came from heaven and said, I am well pleased with him. Luke says the voice 
from heaven called Jesus my chosen one, but all three accounts assert, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone one with them but Jesus only. Matthew has Jesus saying, stop being afraid. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Well, I noticed that after six days connects immediately with Peter confessing the faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the big event that happened just before this moment of transfiguration on that high mountain. Jesus, in that moment that that Peter confessed, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, committed to the cross, began preaching the gospel uh, in inception as he prepared the disciples for what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. He would not be deterred from dying and rising again. He even told Peter, when Peter got in the way, get behind me, Satan. You're not looking after the things of God. You're looking after the things that matter to only to you. Well, Jesus told us that to follow him, we must deny ourselves and take up our crosses. That's the call to discipleship. It has never been lessened. It has always been the same. Jesus' purpose was to call us to deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow him. In Matthew, Jesus gave a promise to build his church in the future tense. In Acts, that church is spoken of in the past tense. Now, six days later, Peter, James, and John followed Jesus up a very high mountain. They saw Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. They felt great terror in those few moments that they were there on the mountain seeing this, this wonderful sight. They saw a cloud enveloping them. They heard a voice from heaven speaking directly to them. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And suddenly it all was gone. While they came down from the mountain, Jesus said, Keep this to yourselves until after my, my resurrection. Well, the reality is that you're in the struggle of your own metamorphosis now. Just as we saw the transformation of Jesus from being in the existence, uh, in existing in the form of God and taking the form of a servant to become a man, seeing him humbly and walking with them on dusty roads and listening to him speak and, and teach, and then to take a moment to see the glory that was the inner reality of Jesus shine for just a moment is a picture of the kind of metamorphosis that you and I are undergoing even now. A caterpillar becomes a butterfly by way of the struggle of metamorphosis. See, metamorphosis is a struggle. It's a struggle of transformation that takes place in the cocoon. It's the struggle that strengthens the butterfly's wings that enable it to fly. And if you somehow stop the struggle, if you open the cocoon, the butterfly will be unable to fly. It will just land on the ground, and there it will die. Well, you were born again by the Spirit from above, says John chapter 3. You were born again to a living hope through Jesus' resurrection, says 1 Peter 1 verse 3. You were buried with him in baptism into death and raised up to walk in newness of life in him, Romans 6 4. From the moment of conception and throughout all of life, a person struggles to be born, to grow, to mature, and finally to decline and to die until we are raised in resurrection. You see, the person who in this life of struggle has faith in Jesus will awaken to eternal life in all of its fullness. We've begun to experience it, but all of its fullness will come later on in the resurrection. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall all be changed. Your metamorphosis then is a struggle of repentance and faith. 
You see, you enter into eternal life by repentance and faith. Repentance is turning from sin. Faith is is turning to God. In repentance, you're changing your mind, and it's such a significant change of mind that it will result in other changes that take place in your life, a change of behavior, a change in, in character. In faith, you're convinced that the gospel is the finished work of Christ, and that this finished work of Christ is what saves you. It is not your own effort. Repentance and faith, though, both begin and continue throughout your life in this world until the resurrection occurs and the final transformation awakens you. You're struggling with mental metaphor metamorphosis. Romans 12, 2 says that by the mercies of God, you are a living sacrifice. And it goes on to say, so you must stop being conformed to this world but be being transformed, that is, undergoing metamorphosis, the same word used to describe what happened to Jesus, by the renewing of your mind. It's the ongoing renewing of your mind. Your metamorphosis, then, is a comprehensive, uh, a qualitative renovation of your whole inner life, the way that you look at the world, the way that you see yourself, the way that you see other people. The Spirit of God uses the scriptures that he inspired to instruct you, to reprove you, to correct you, and to train you in righteousness so you will be thoroughly equipped to do every good work that God has outlined for you. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Eugene Peterson writes about his little dog in the Wyoming wilderness. Sometimes the coyotes would bring down a white-tailed deer and their little dog would, roaming around on the farm, would find a, a large bone. He always seemed attracted. This little dog always seemed attracted to the big bones, and he'd bring this big bone up to, up to them, and and he would prance around with it and show off about it, and and he would reap their praise because they pat him on the back and they would say, "Good boy," and but then disappearing with his treasure, he'd start gnawing on that bone. And as he gnawed on that bone, he began to growl with delight. As he knows, uh, gnaws at the pleasure of the bone, he just understands that it's, it has some good meaning for him. Interestingly, that gnawing and growling with pleasure is the same picture that a wise person who delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on it day and night has when they're reading the Bible. You're getting with the program. If you're reading the Bible to H-E-A-R, hear God speak, so that you can go about living in the new way of the Spirit. That's an acrostic I want you to remember. H-E-A-R. It stands for this. H means highlight. You're reading your Bible, then underscore verses that seem important to you, or that kind of jump off the page, or, or or kind of pique your interest. Just highlight them, underscore them. In my Bible, I use red ink, and I underscore a lot of stuff and write notes in the margin. E is explain. It's a good idea to think about what you have just read and try to explain it. You don't have to go into a thorough, deep exegetical study of a passage of scripture in order to begin to explain it. You can grab the surface and that's a good thing to do. That leads you to the next step. A, apply. How does this truth, this instruction or this word of encouragement or even this promise, how does it intersect with your life? How does it affect your relationships? How does it impact you personally? How does it speak to where you are in the living of your life day by day? Which leads us to the final step, R, respond. What's the first thing you must do to take in order to form this truth, this reality, into your life. It's what God says. What can you do today to get started with it? It's a simple thing. So reading the Bible to hear God speak is a matter of highlight, explain, apply, and respond. And if you'll just take the time to 
to gnaw away at a scripture verse, it will yield wonderful reward. I want to encourage you, if you want to know more about this H-E-A-R, reading the Bible to hear God speak, then check out Replicate Ministries, www.replicate.org, R-E-P-L-I-C-A-T-E dot O-R-G. It's a good place. Now, sadly, most of you are not even reading your Bible, and that's true if we are a typical congregation. So a first step for any one of us might be to just block out a time, a little bit of time. It's a good way to begin. 10 minutes, 15 minutes to read your Bible and use this here metaphor, this 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 way of highlighting, explaining, applying, and responding as a way to get into the Word. You're in a struggle for mental metamorphosis, but you're also in a struggle for lifestyle metamorphosis. See, you were born again by means of conversion. Your faith propels you into a new way of living. Ephesians 1 says that your life is for the praise of the glory of his grace in Christ. Your life is meant to be a tribute to Jesus. So in salvation, sinners become saints. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come to be. You're in the struggle for a vocational metamorphosis as well. Because you were saved by grace through faith in Christ for good works that God planned for you to do in advance. Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, who were created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has a work for us to do. That's our vocation in life. Well, there's a great way to apply this. Since we are his workmanship, God is not finished with me yet. I'm a work in progress. So are you. Uh, You're not all that you were meant to be. You will not realize the fullness of what God has saved you for until you get to heaven. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14 says, I do one thing, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I just want to do what God wants me to do with my life. Now you're struggling in the transformation of his church also. We are many spiritually gifted members who make up one body under the direction of the Holy Spirit. This is an exceedingly important uh, concern for us in the life of the church today. Every person on a sports team has to do his job for the team to be successful. Now, how impressive were the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the Super Bowl? I don't know whether you cared for the Super Bowl or not, but but you have to admit that offensive line protected Brady and he was able to pick apart the Kansas City defense. The defense overwhelmed Kansas City's offense and harassed Mahomes the whole game. As good as Mahomes is, he didn't have the opportunity to play at his highest level because those around him were failing in the job that they were doing. It never matters how impressive a single player is if the rest of the team falls down. And that's the truth about the church. It does not matter how gifted or intelligent or wonderful or intended, uh, wonderfully intended we, we may be. We may individually be. It matters if we work together. So we've got to beware of lone rangering in your Christian life. Beware of expecting someone else to do your job. There is something that God has for you to do, and he intended for no one else to try to do it. Mushers who are preparing to run the Iditarod must have a team of dogs that pull together if they are to be successful, if they're even to make it to the finish line. Teams that do not work together work against the effectiveness and the success of the team. And so it is with the church. We are many members, but one body. 
because of all these different transformations that are occurring, because of the, the struggle of metamorphosis that is taking place, I want to reassert transformation is an important and urgent need in contemporary Christian life, both for you as an individual Christian and for us as a church. So I want us to take a moment and let's just bow together before our Father and let's have a word of prayer and we'll conclude this time of study. Our Father, we are grateful that you gave us the gift of eternal life in our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we're beginning to experiencing it, to experience it even now, but we're in the midst of the struggle that will result in what we will be for eternity when we go through that time of resurrection to come. We thank you for the picture of what we shall be that we saw in Jesus as he was transfigured on that high mountain. We thank you for the hope that we have that eternal life will last forever and this beginning will be good for all time. We thank you that your blessings are upon us. We thank you that as the sun comes out and the snow begins to melt and life gets back to normal, the temperatures will warm and life will go on. We thank you that uh, COVID will not continue forever, but that you will give us victory over it. We thank you that in coming together to worship as soon as we can, we will experience goodness and grace and blessing and peace. And we give you thanks for it in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and for his sake. Amen.